Just a minute. Just a minute. Uh -huh. Hold on. <laughs> All right. <sighs> Why are Pastor Wilkes and Jim Picard here? Pastor Wilkes has dealt with this kind of thing before. Jim has a son, Eddie, who, um, you were a little boy, but... What'd they do to him? Oh, no. You silly thing. They didn't do anything to him. They did things for him. All right? Just like they're gonna do things for you. Your father's wondering. He's wondering how to help. We've got one question for you, son. I want to let you sleep. It's been a good day. I have shared our conversations with these two fine upstanding men, and I've asked them for their guidance. I can tell you right now, we don't have all the answers, but I do know you're going to hold the key to the next step. Mother and I. We cannot see a way that you can live under this roof, attend service, work at the dealership. If we both fundamentally go against the grain of our beliefs and against God himself. I want to ask you that question, my son. In your heart. You want to change. Yes. Yes, I want to change. Okay, so I'm going to provide, I've been asked to provide a little context on this. Um, and one of the things that I think is really helpful about the movie and, and something that I also talked about in my book is, um, you know, this idea that we have a choice in those situations, especially when we're above 18. Um, and, you know, parents ask us this question, like, do you want to change? But the context around that is that, um, you know, leaving your faith and leaving your family and the God that you have always known your whole life uh, is an impossible task. And, you know, a lot of people in the past have said things like, well, why, you, why didn't you just go to a bigger city or something like that, which is such an ignorant thing for people to say um, because we don't have the resources to do so often. And being in a big city doesn't help you that much, you know, in terms of um, making sure that you don't encounter that sort of thinking again. I mean, when I lived in New York City, there were several um, places that were still doing conversion therapy that I was told about from people who had survived it. And so, um, you know, it's, I think a lot of um, these ex-gay organizations, and I put that in quotations, um, I think that they often rely on a kind of reasoning that, um, oh, well, you know, they, they had a choice, adults have a choice, et cetera. Um, but I explored this in, in a podcast that we did with Radio Lab called Unerased, where um, really the history is much more complicated than that. And a lot of advocates have um, said for a long time that like, yeah, I mean, I guess you could frame it as a choice, except everything in society has been geared to make us feel like it's an impossible thing to live as an openly queer person in the United States. And um, if you live in a place that makes you feel that way, it's not really a choice. And so, um, as many panelists have said here today, it's, it's just incredibly important for us to 
um, acknowledge the fact that personal stories, telling these stories over and over again, sharing the facts to parents around the country, to other family members, guardians, whoever it is that is in charge of a child, um, that they are aware of the kinds of, of dangerous things that conversion therapy can do to someone's mind. Um, and also, you know, people who are confused by their own faith experience. Um, and the last thing I'll say um, on that subject is, like, I just think it's really up to us as a community to keep this story alive um, as, as places go underground. So, yeah. I, want, I wanted to thank you, Garrett, for sharing that. Our next question actually is um, um, aimed towards you as well. And it's um, asking if you could maybe speak a little bit about your healing process after um, surviving conversion therapy. Yeah, I can definitely do that. I think that's incredibly important and it's often missed in the conversation. Um, a lot of people are like, why didn't you write another memoir about how things got better? And I'm like, maybe later, I need more time. It took me 10 years to write Boy Erased um, because I waited that long before I, I, I wrote about it because I was so angry. Um, but part of, part of my healing, um, you know, honestly, it came from community. Um, from people who were willing to take me in and show me the kind of love that I'd seen um, in my church, but people who were queer and maybe you know, some of those were LGBTQ Christians and some of those were in other faiths and some of them were agnostic or atheists and um, just seeing like kind of a bigger picture was really helpful for me. And also, um, you know, I did a lot of travel, to be honest. I went to Ukraine in the Peace Corps for three years. I lived in Bulgaria for three years. Um, I traveled the world a lot, like on a shoestring budget, and I just kind of, um, I was really interested in, in practicing what, um, what we'd often preached in church about compassion and, and sort of learn from activists and people on the ground that were organizing and doing um, HIV AIDS training and education. Um, it was just really great. And I think that um, the healing, you know, it was slow, but uh, what I understood, and I think what a lot of us understand um, when we start to heal is that for better or worse, you know, anger is something that um, can destroy you, you know, and um, I'm not saying it's not justified sometimes or that we don't need it. Sometimes when we do activism, anger can be a very great tool. Um, and, uh, but, but like for me personally, I just can't, that's not my personality. You know, I just had to find a way to, to bring myself